There are so many burning issues in our country to contemplate. And this morning, we're going to be contemplating them. One crucial matter that we often sweep under the carpet, heart health, and how we had our major cardiothoracic center. Well, today, the man behind it, the man who has also served as minister, well, for environment, science, and technology. You know him now. He joins me in the studio as we dilate on the center among other crucial issues of national scope. I am pleased to give you, ladies and gentlemen, Professor Kwabna Frimpong Boate. He joins me in the studio this morning. Prof, Hello. good morning. I think we can do it. <laughs> thank you very much, and thank you for having me on your program. It's good to have you. It's good to have you. I, I noticed it's my joy to be here. Your lapel pin with the Ghana flag. Yes. You love Ghana, don't you? Ghana first. Ghana first always. Mm -hmm. Always. You know, it reminds me of the Germans, since you've been in Germany for a long time. Uh, you know, in the period of the war, the Germans had this saying, Deutschland über alles. Yes. Germany over everything. all. Yes. Over everything. Mm -hmm. And um, in our case, it is Ghana over all. Uh, I mean, not in a negative sense. The national anthem is there. That sentence is there. Mm -hmm. Deutschland über alles. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. Um, so tell me, it's been quite a journey. People hear of you today and they're thinking this, they're thinking that, they're thinking of Gualamsi. We'll, we'll get into some of those much later. But the cardiothoracic center, your brainchild, tell us about your journey, how it all started from studying in Germany to wanting to come back to Ghana and serve. Walk us through that journey. Well, it's, it's a very long journey. I don't know whether we have the time to go. Yeah. But I'm just uh, when I get to a point, you stop me. Um, it started when I decided to do my postgraduate in, in Germany. And so I left Ghana in April 1978 to study the German language first uh, for six months. And then um, I got a place to study at the uh, Hanover Medical School. Actually, it's, that is the only medical university in Germany. The, wow. The dedicated to medicine. And so I, because the person who invited me, who accepted me, was a cardiothoracic surgeon, I decided to stay with him because Germany, we need that kind of protection. And so, uh, although initially I wanted to do trauma and orthopedics, I decided to stay with the man. So I became, uh, I did cardiothoracic surgery. Uh, and then later on, there were really four, three or four reasons that solidified my. Uh, resolved to do cardiothoracic surgery. Because when I was in Ghana, uh, there was a time uh, we were medical students and there was a girl, a young girl called Teresa, uh, who had a hole in her heart. And uh, the newspapers were soliciting for funds to send this girl abroad for surgery. Uh, but they were not successful. And unfortunately, Teresa died. It stuck with me. And then a friend of mine, called Akwabua, uh, who in the rented school in a career, he finished from four, went to Kumasi to learn shoemaking. You know, shoemakers have uh, a wooden board they put on their laps, and they use a small sharp knife to cut the leather. Mm. One day, the knife slipped into his groin Oof. and cut the big artery in the groin, supplying the whole of the right leg. So he was taken to the big hospital in Kumasi. In those days, we didn't have the experts, we didn't have the material and, and to do things. So uh, my friend lost his leg. The whole leg was disarticulated. Uh, and so he lost the, the leg. Then the third reason was that uh, we all know Professor Eastman, who performed the first open heart surgery in Ghana in 1964. Uh, but after the coup, uh, he stopped. And then a lot of things were happening in Kolebu. And he wasn't happy, so he stopped heart surgery. So when I was in Germany, I said, well, with my knowledge, my attitude, and the way I look at things, if I don't go back to Ghana to continue from where Ismael left, it might take 50 years, 100 years, before another person will come. Or maybe it may not happen at all. That was the third reason. The fourth one was very personal. My own father, um, I mean, who died before I was born, died uh, at the age of 24. And my mother was, I think, five months pregnant with me. Wow. And apparently, he was traveling from Viviani to uh, Kumasi to buy some things for his business. And he had an accident on the way and died. He didn't die on the spot. Uh, apparently, he died from injuries to the chest, chest injuries, um, internal bleeding at the age of 24. 
So I said, well, maybe then I better do this uh, so that I will save young men so that their children will not be semi orphans So that's basically how that the, journey began. Began. the journey began. And then so, but when I came back, you know, interesting enough, you know, my mother, my own mother had an aneurysm of the aorta. Wow. And I had to operate on her. Because those days, I was you the only person... on your own mother? Yes. Hmm. I was the only person who could do that. But later on, of course, we trained people and then... What was it like, though, knowing that your own mother's life was in your hands? No, I shut off. When I, as soon as I go to the theater and see, then I disconnect at all. Because if you don't do it, I'm not that emotional. Uh, that one, this is the first time I've operated on relatives. So I, I shut off and then I did my job. And she was well. And uh, interspersing the conversation, you would see some of the pictures and maybe even videos will be sprinkling in there in respect of Prof and his work. But let me, let me come to Ghana. What did it take to put up the cardiothoracic center we know now? Because this was basically your sweat, your blood, your effort. You did something that no one probably does. I mean, you came and all of this was on your shoulders. Tell us about it. Yeah, it was difficult because I was determined, you know, I knew, you know, my mother was very young, my father died 24 years. I, I, didn't, I don't come from a rich family. But one thing I know is that we came to this world with nothing and we go with nothing. And so I was determined to do something. Mm. The money was not my focus. I, I wanted to do something. And so when I came down, uh, the Germans were prepared to give us surprise credit to buy the equipment. But they said they were not, were not going to build for us. And the government was not to, uh, in a position to build for us. So I started. I got what, some, which period was this? Well, this is 1989. Okay. Uh, and so, so the PNDC? That was PNDC. PNDC uh, was that was Chairman Rollins, uh, right. uh, who was the head of state at the time. Uh, but he did very well. I mean, uh, I give him full marks because, strangely enough, I had never seen him before, never saw him until the day he came to commission the center on the 4th of April, 2nd April, 1992. And so what he did told me that he did that not out of political expediency, but a genuine concern for the health needs of the, of the people. So I admired him and I made, I made sure I wrote to him to thank him for what he did. And not only him, uh, his people, Kosi Boche, was very helpful. Uh, Professor Kosi Boche, Professor Kosi Boche. Blessed memory. Yes. Mm. P.B. Obin, also, and Misata, strangely in love with all gone. Uh, you mean the former vice president? Yes. He then, was, he was then a deputy minister, the... deputy secretary for health those days. Mm. He was deputy to Kosi Boche in the finance ministry. And uh, Obusia J from Winneba, so he, he was there in the MPP in those days. And then Nana Koku Sapon was brilliant, you know, Atu Ahoy. Atu Ahoy. Atu Ahoy, he started everything. Uh, you know, Mrs. Grant was more or less a mother to me and he was very concerned. Um, but the difficulties I had was from my own colleagues, you know, in Kumasi, especially in Kolebu, people were just bent on making sure that the thing didn't come on. Wait, but, wait, hold, hold on. I've chronicled you everything. You were trying to resuscitate because this person you had mentioned had done something in that area yeah. and then got frustrated and left. Yeah. You came down, yeah. spent your time, your own resources yeah. to put something up and you're telling me that your colleague medical practitioners, doctors, yes. were trying to sabotage you. Yes. To what end? Well, so that it doesn't come on at all. I mean, it's, I'm saying this, I, I'm not... I'm not a, Conjoining stories. I've chronicled all these things in a book. Uh, right. Keep them in my heart. Uh, maybe we'll come to that later on. So I don't want to go into those details. Let, let's talk about them now. Which one? I mean, some of these challenges you face from your own, those in the medical fraternity. You know, for example, um, that I should not be given a ward. You know, I didn't have a ward to admit patients when I came in when I had no ward. That's why I was determined to build. I didn't have an operating theater. I, I didn't have people to help me. I didn't have, even have doctors to help me. In the few, first few years, I was alone, taking blood from patients, taking them to the lab, running all the rounds that house officers should, should, have, could be, uh, should be doing. I did all these things. And people were just, just trying to make sure that uh, things became tough and we wouldn't get on. And even someone even suggested 
to the head of anesthesia uh, that uh, the, he should go and further with the equipment on the intensive care unit uh, so that when patients are put in them, uh, they will die and I'll be discredited. Goodness me, you're... T no, no, I, I, I don't think you're saying what I think you're saying. I'm, I'm, I'm saying this. Someone wanted the head of anesthesia. To fiddle with equipment so equipment. that people would die and you would be. I'll be healthy. discredited. Pa patient, uh, heart patient that are operated on will, will not survive and I'll be discredited. So the head of anesthesia told him to put it on paper. What he was saying? Yes, for implementation. Of course, he would not be able of course to. Because he will not do it. So he came to me. The head of anesthesia came to me and said, Kabina, be careful of this man. And of course, what that person did subsequently told me that uh, I had to be very careful. Have you ever felt, I mean, at that time, and we'll come to even the current dispensation, have you, has your life ever been threatened? My life? Yes. Well, I don't, I don't know. Maybe, <laughs> no, I, I will not say so. Maybe through some other means, but not direct physical threat. Not direct physical threat. But people, people you know, try to do some things. You know, someone invited me to a party <clears throat> and, uh, you know, from what he was behaving and what people were telling me, I didn't have to be a sister to decline that invitation. There was an attempt on your life, yes, I suspect yes, yes, yes. Uh, let, Let's go back to Kolibu. And I, I, I want to walk through a few things when it comes to Kolibu before we move on. The cardiothoracic center is now what, 35 years? 35 years. 35 this years. years. Look at how time flies. You know, 35 years. <clears throat> when I came down, I was a very young man, you know, 39. And, so, and now look at you, look at after me. all the years, decades, <laughs> look at my, and now you've grayed. I look at some of your pictures from back then and I look at look you. Look at my gear, you know. <laughs> <laughs> but that's life. Mm. When, when you look at the center now, what do you see? The center deteriorated after, after I've left there because of the way I was driven out. Um, but then now... But why do you use the term driven out? I was asked to leave. You know, it's just like driving God away from the universe he created. This, they were behaving like atheists. Atheists are people, I think, who drive God away from the university created. Anyway, so, uh, but now we have a director, in the person of Professor Mark Tete, mm. who is trying to, you know, bridge gaps and do things, and I think he's doing very well, and we, we need, uh, he needs our support. We have to support him. Do you feel the cardiothoracic center could have been bigger, better, offering because you look at Kolibu and the role it plays in the West African sub-region, and this is not now. Even in the Gagisberg era, it had been playing that role. Um, do you feel there are missed opportunities, that it could have been better than what it is now? Oh, yes. In fact, um, three years before I left, I started a program, to, first of all, to train people. That's the first thing. Train people, some doctors were sent uh, doctor to South Africa to learn pediatric heart surgery, one was sent to India, I wanted to send one to Canada to so specialize in some areas of heart surgery. And then we designed a new cardiothoracic center, you know, a big block, and we thought we could get land in Legon, you know, because the medical school has, I think, 400 acres of land. That was what was there for by Nkrumah for the medical school. You so, mean uh, the University Legon, of Ghana University campus? Of Ghana. Yes, campus. Right. So I did a presentation before the vice chancellor the drawings and everything, uh, but we did not get the support. Basically, we wanted 20 acres so that we, can, we could build a new cardiothoracic center there, but it didn't work. And also, the director who took over for me was not interested in uh, you know, any new project and so on. And so I left and that, that's what happened. But you are right, there should be, because we were on top. I mean, when we started, we were just a part with Many heart surgery heart centers in the world, not in Africa. When I'm doing something, I do something to the world standard. I don't, I don't like issues like Africa, Sub-Saharan Africa, or West Africa, sub region No, no, no. We aim at the world standards, and that's where we are. We were. But then, now, the technology is also old, using 1990 technologies in many areas. And we need training. We need to train more people, you know. Mm -hmm anesthetists, surgeons, nurses, uh, technicians, in many fields in heart surgery. Heart surgery is very complex. And so, but we, 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 we lag behind, and now we need to fight very hard to come up again. 
Speaking of heart surgery, if you go back into the centuries, at a point it was contemplated that you could operate on every other organ but the heart. It was a no-go area scientifically. Y yes. And then, I think sometime in the 19th century, it was there proven is, that 18, it is indeed possible. 1896. Uh, exactly. Actually, 19th even 19th. before then, there was a, a black person, uh, Dr. Hale Williams in the U.S., mm. four years before the official uh, date, he performed the first heart surgery, but he was not recognized. Uh, in, in the U.S. The typical stereotype. It's, yes, and then until 1896, when uh, one German, Ludwig Rehn, uh, did the first heart surgery, that is, there was a wound on the surface of the heart and he, he stitched it, and that was the first open heart surgery. For you, at the cardio center, while you were there, what are some of the milestones in terms of heart surgery you performed that readily come to your mind? Uh, the, the new innovations that we, we brought to the world, and not just surgeries, you know, like there were many of them. But then, for example, we were the first in Ghana to safely operate on patients with sickle cell disease who needed heart surgery. Because, wow. yes, because throughout the world, they say they have low hemoglobin, and so they will give them, they make a stage transfusion, and thereby introduce infection. No, but we said, uh, and also that you cannot expose sickle cell patients to cold, because even when the weather gets cold, they get into crisis. Yeah. But we devised a way of operating on them, doing open heart surgery with heart lung machine, hypothermia, safely. And this is recorded in the word literature. Uh, there were other things that we did, also operating on Jehovah's Witnesses, you know. You know, people, when they I, were I thought they, they, they did not blood transfusion. Yes, device. they would not accept blood transfusion, but that was a challenge to me and to the team. Mm. So how do we engage them? You know, people tend to just, you know, when people have uh, appear difficult, they, they are dismissed. But we don't do that. We see it as a challenge to bring something new. So I had a meeting with the Jehovah Witnesses and told them, discuss our new bed that we wanted to use. That was, before surgery, we'll give them uh, medicines to boost up the hemoglobin, and then once they are anesthetized, we will take blood from them, the patient himself or herself, but not disconnect the needle from the vein. So after the surgery, we give back, because during the surgery, you dilute the blood, the hemodilution and so on, and then you destroy some of the blood factors. But then if you have taken fresh blood from them, you can give it back to them, and they accept it because the blood has not left the body. It's still in contact. So we devised this method and also published wow. it, which has been accepted in the world literature. You know, uh, there did, are, did you start that? Yes. You started that? Yes. In the world? In the world. Just like the uh, sickle cell disease. And, it, and the, the, the thing is that the sickle cell one, we wrote a scientific paper, wanted to publish it in the European Journal of Cardiothoracic Surgery. When it went at first, they said, oh, sickle cell disease is tropical disease. It's not, we don't want to publish it, publish it in some African uh, journal. So I wrote back to them. I said, look, me, I train in Hanover, you know me, and that you wish to stop your arrogance. Now let me tell you why. There was a Ghanaian doctor, a radiologist, I don't want to mention the name. He had sickle cell disease. He was in Germany for a conference. And he went to the, the Cologne uh, Tower, Church Tower, and on top there, he had sickle cell crisis. He went to hospital, and they treated him according to what they know, extreme transfusion, antibiotics, and so on. In the end, the man had methicillin resistance, uh, staph aureus infection, an infection that could not be treated with antibiotics. They bonded him here to Ghana, and he died. I said, look, this is how you treated my countryman. This is a new method. I want you to publish it. Of course, then they did. Wow. So we have to be fair. Uh, and then, and there are, at this which time will not permit me to narrate. But of course, over those years. So, so how long exactly were you there? I was there from 89 to 2011. Okay. So that's, that's, that's quite a long time. Because there was nothing there. We had to build everything. You know, train people. As I said, I, I came alone. But the other <laughs> aspects which maybe it may interest you, you know, before I came down... So that's, I just looked at the figures. That's 22 years. Yes. 22. 
out yeah. of the 35. Yes. So before uh, we started it all, I came to Ghana and uh, we got some Ghanaians to be tra trained to form the nucleus of the staff at the cardio center. So uh, we had uh, perfectionists, Mr. Amuzu, some nurses and so on. And so they were there with me in Germany for uh, one year. We trained as a team and they came back a year before I came. But when I arrived in Kolebu, Kolebu authorities told me that before they left for Germany for the training, they were working for some people in Kolebu, so I cannot have them. And so, although I was alone struggling at the, to set up the Chicago Center, people who had, I had trained were working in some small, small units in Kolebu, they would not send them to me. Until I wrote back to Germany, and the Germans, Germans sent me seven people, and they stayed with me for seven years. And then Kolibu saw the stupidity in the action, and then they released the nurses to me. And when they came, then we started a training program to train nurses, technicians, and doctors for the center. That is why you see, you see, so, so, uh, yeah, yeah go, sorry. You, you go ahead, go ahead. That is why, that was the start of the intensive care, uh, perioperative and critical nursing school in Kolibu. Mm. And in Kadu Center is still the place where they do their practical training. That was the beginning, because I saw the need. Before the cardio center, there was no intensive care in this country. There was no chronic dialysis. We started chronic dialysis in this country. Okay. And I set it up, both at the cardio center and then in Kolebu Hospital. And uh, before we go to that picture that you know, uh, we're looking at uh, currently, you know, it just hit me sometimes why it appears unless someone from the other side. You know, Kwame Nkrumah said, we, we are here to prove that the black man is capable of managing his own affairs. Yes. But it appears every step of the way we act as though we were not capable of doing anything until from Amanoni, the other side, yeah, someone comes through. Sometimes you, you wonder the mentality. Because the criminal never had one year of peace, you know, after his life all the time, look at all the attempts on his life and, and so on. So, and some of the things that he did uh, to me were as a result of the treatment he was given mm. as he was. Us. So well, let's talk about that picture. This, this picture is, uh, we had a picnic at Kokrobite. I see. Yeah, so, and I was, I was mashing the pepper and, uh, and uh, tomatoes for uh, Kinke. <laughs> is that Malta Mot Guinness or the other one this that we one used to is, have? It's like Malta Guinness, it? yes. Right. Mm. Hey, you reminded man of many things. Right? You see, oh. <laughs> yeah. And there you were doing the do. I was doing or Puerto Meco. I was at Puerto Meco, yeah. Be before we move on to other issues, though, I just want to find out. Kolebu generally. I mean, you remember from last year, dialysis. You've mentioned chronic, you know. Yeah, because I set up the Kolebu chronic exactly. dialysis unit. Exactly. Yeah. The, the renal center and the cost of things and all the things that came up from last year. When you look at Kolebu and how it's been managed, what, what do you see? What do you see when you look at Kolebu today? Are you happy? Not happy, but you see the, the chief, chief CEO now is doing quite well. He is trying. Uh, but Kolebu is like a monster. Kolebu is like a monster. Yeah, you cannot care, you cannot feed, and you cannot tame. Wow. So, Kolebu is like a monster. You cannot feed, you cannot kill, you cannot tame. You cannot tame. So what do you do with it? Yeah, so that is the, that is the, that is the challenge, you know. And it's not the Kolebu land, but the people who are working there. And the influence from the Minister of Health. I, I was, I would say I was strong enough to resist some of these things, you know. And I could generate money internally to do a lot of the things that we did. And we did a lot in Kolebu. So Kolebu needs a lot of attention. You imagine a, a small a hotel with, uh, let's say, 50 beds. Mm. Look at the amount of money that is spent on, on that hotel. And Kolebu is a big hotel with 2,000 beds and about 5,000 workers. And it doesn't get more than, you know, maybe 10, 20 million dollars a year. No. But a hospital that size will be getting billions of dollars a year to manage and to make sure that people are trained, the equipment is up to date, and that there are resources to motivate people to work there. So, Kolebu is a very difficult place to work, uh, but I think we managed to do the best we, we could. Mm. I, I'll stay briefly on the health sector, moving away from Kolebu specifically, but broadly, the health sector. Um, CAF, 
for example, the Kung Fu Anoche Teaching Hospital has had myriad problems. Or two for, or say two, uh, the second has had to intervene. And recently, it even came to the fore that some logistics had been brought to the port. And guess what? The cost was hideous. They couldn't, they couldn't clear them. And I hear there was some intervention from the vice president, though I hear the claim put out by some uh, online outlets that he had donated one million was not true, but he, he apparently is lending some assistance. When you look at our hospital setup or our health setup, including health insurance, what, what are the crucial problems to be addressed? It's the management, you know, uh, and the interference. The hospitals are not, and again, let me also say that the institutional care division of the Ministry of Health is not working well. You know, this is a division that is supposed to make sure that the hospitals work well, that we have staff we can project into the future and say, what, what do we need for dialysis? What do you need for heart surgery? What do you need for cancer care? What do you need for the care of children with special diseases and so on? That division is not working well. And so the planning is not there. And there's also centralization of purchasing. You know, uh, somebody gets a contract to supply x-rays and is both centrally and, and supply to uh, a lot of hospitals in Ghana. Whether they have radiologists or not, that's a, a secondary question. So there are some of these human little corruption issues uh, that prevent uh, things from working. But if we really mean to do it, it can be done. Right. It can be done. But that's, that's what I think. And, uh, but these days, the CEOs don't have the strength to resist some of the pressures from above. I was able to do that. Is, is it that they don't have the strength to resist or the pressures have become insurmountable? Both. But then, if you resist, you may be sacked. But I was, I'm not afraid of being sacked anywhere uh, because I don't depend upon anybody for my sustenance. Mm. And so, as I said, Ghana first, and we try to work for, for Ghana and say and do things that are in the interest of this country. Agenda 111. Is it realistic? Is what? Realistic? Is it realistic? Well, I think it was a very good initiative from the government saying that you want to build hospitals for all districts in Ghana. But usually, the implementation, that's where the issue is. Um, I don't know the details of um, how it's been implemented, but I would probably have done things differently in the sense that I said, okay, we want to build 111 hospitals, but let's do it in phases. Let's start with, let's say, 45, 50, and complete those 50 hospitals. And then uh, probably you have to start from, not from the political end, but from the practical end. So you are going to build hospitals. What are they going to do? What level of care do you want to give? Who are going to work there? Which nurses, type of nurses, doctors, pharmacists, technicians are going to work there? Laboratory scientists and so on. And then if you know the numbers and what you want to do, then you can start training or getting ready for the hospitals. And then, where are you going to get equipment from? And so on. So when you solve all these technical problems, then you come to the construction side. But we start with construction, and because that is lucrative. You know, you get friends and things to do the construction. And even now, we have been told uh, that maybe a percentage of the structures are, or some structures are at a certain percentage of completion. And you ask yourself, completion of what? the physical structures or the hospital. And these are the things that worry me. But basically, it's a good thing when the government wants to build hospitals for the people. But how to implement it? And if we say a building is completed, it's not that building, that physical structure, but the hospital must be completed. I don't think we are near uh, to complete any of the 101 hospitals. But was it overambitious? I mean, people have even said that you put up these 101 hospitals. Which nurses and doctors are going there? When you, look at, when you look at your, your turnover, when it comes to yes. uh, doctors and nurses, the numbers coming out every year, it, it, you are not going to fill this. And putting the structure there is not the same as a hospital. It's just the shell. Yes. The equipment and everything. So, so have, did we get this right? If you look at the, is it uh, 19, 17, $17 million or $19 million planned for every uh, such 
hospital. Well, well it's, it's, not, it's, not, it's not a sin to be over ambitious. Mm. Uh, if only we have planned for it. Mm. It's not, and not, if it's not political ambition, then it's, it's good. But uh, as you're saying, I don't think we can complete all these things. Uh, in, in, but the, the bad thing is to start all the 111 and not complete 70 percent of them. Mm. It's good to start with maybe 10, 15, 20 percent and complete those ones in phases, and then come to the next. Making sure that when the buildings are completed, you have the money to buy the equipment, the instrument, train nurses, doctors, and determine where what type of care will be there, so that we'll be able to plan for. Uh, future consumables, so that they don't start and then after two months, they don't have syringes, they don't have needles, they don't have drugs and so on. It's a, it's a serious planning. Some hospitals don't even have thermometers. Yeah, and again, that is my point. When I was minister, I believe that no country will develop without the capacity to build something, develop something, and produce some, some, some things. We cannot sit here and import everything from toothpick to aircraft and hope that one day we'll be developed. We must do certain things so that we'll be producing things. Uh, I don't see why we should be importing syringes and, and uh, maybe gloves and so on when we have rubber factories, uh, rubber plantation, and you know, I, I don't want to go into those areas, but we need serious thinking in this country. Mm. And, and you don't think that that sort of serious thinking went into Agenda 111? Well, some thinking wants to do it, but not to my standard. My standards are very high. And, but I believe that uh, it was a good thing to decide to build. But so then, by, by, by extension, it, it, it's a good policy, but it wasn't well thought through. And implemented. It wasn't well thought through and not well implemented. Well implemented, yeah. I, on, on the same trajectory, doom so. And, and why do I bring this in? Apart from your personal life and what your experiences may be and what we're all experiencing, I mean, overnight, you know, once it starts raining, you know your lights will be going on and off a bit. But the Tema General Hospital recently had a bit of a crisis. And the NICU, the Neonatal Intensive Care Unit, suffered. The claim is that though the, the hospital came out to state in a statement that no one had died, a lady also said that a doctor had literally told her that, listen, when the power went out, we could not use certain equipment and your child died, a baby that had just been born. For two hours, they didn't have power in a place with, you know, incubators and the rest. The, the children were... How do we deal with this? And when you look at Dumso, especially from the past and what we've been through and now, what is your reaction? Well, I think that it, it shouldn't, shouldn't happen. Um, a, a hospital that size should have... Um, standby generator. They did. With the generator for that unit was also, it, they realized then that it had a problem. So for two hours, they were working on it. But two hours is enough time for many people it's to a, die. It's a long time in, in the hospital. Mm. Where, what I would say is that doing so is not good. It shouldn't happen. And the president assured us that he has solved it. So has he solved it? I'm surprised that uh, he's still around. Maybe power shortages here and there. But is that what we call doing so? So here's the thing. <laughs> For about two years now, yes. there have been problems. Today they will tell you it's generation. Next day, it is not generation. Recently, we've heard from the ECG telling us, uh, what's, what's the story again? Let me just, uh, it's local, localized something. I'll, I'll just get to that story. Um, it, it, it says um, the power outages are now over. Uh, but we know that the situation persists. They've been talking about disruptions due to localized faults and all of that. We said we had excess power. From about two years ago, we know that we don't have excess power. But here's my thinking. If someone solves a problem firsthand, because mind you, this problem started from mainly from the Rawlings era where rural you know, electrification also came to the fore. Kufo, Atta Mills came to a head under Mahama. And the problem regardless of propaganda, was resolved by 2016, the end of 2016. The president even came and took credit and said he had solved it. So if we had solved it, and eight years down the road, you end up here again, that smacks of incompetence, doesn't it? Well, I think we have serious problems with power generation, power transmission, because the transmission system, I'm not an expert, uh, so don't uh, push me too much down that line. 
the power, the transmission system is not that robust. This is what my friends are telling me. Uh, so uh, we need to work on the overall energy available, how it's transmitted, mm. and so on. Uh, and maybe uh, not politicize it, but where people have done wrong, we, we should, or have incompetence, we should point them out. But then we should all come together. And you see, GCG has a problem because of uh, maybe theft, leakages, and all sorts of things. And, and even getting the engineers to work on systems and so on. These are all, we, we should sit down and then look at the challenges that we have in the energy sector. And I think that they, they can be solved. I have interacted with people who know. I, I will not mention their names. And from their presentation to me, I think that if we get the right people there to do the right things without politics, it will be well with us. Let's now uh, just... Um wade a bit into the territory of education. I mean, with what you do, education is, 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 is the conduit. Free SHS. And then feeding problems, other problems in there. And the failure to admit that a review is needed. Then we can talk about the recent uh, deal about tablets being given. You know that promise was made all the way in about 2016 about giving you know, laptops and tablets to uh, teachers and students, uh, for a matter of fact. You look at the recent bit, even the cost, costing, and everything in there is problematic. But let's move away from that. There are schools under trees, children studying on the floor. And some have asked, students hungry in our schools. Will they eat the tablets? It's not a bad thing, no. And going digital is good, yes. But is that the most pressing need? What's your reaction? Well, I know there are challenges, and I'm not an expert in that area. I've not really digested these things. But I think that we have challenges in the education sector. Uh, one particular thing was brought my attention two days ago. One of the uh, young men who work for me at home has a nephew who did, um, who did mechanical engineering in one of the polytechnics in, in, in this country. So I asked the man, what, so what did your nephew study? He says, oh, he studied to repair big machines. So I called the young man. I said, so what did you do? He said, well, uh, we did engineering, but I did CNC, that is, computer numerical control and so on. I said, so did you practice on equipment? He said, no, we never had one piece of equipment to practice on. We were taught the theory and I have completed. And so I asked myself, what, is, what, is, what can this young man do with whatever he, he, taught, he was taught? Yeah. So, so the education must be targeted. Education is there to help us solve our problems. See, if we don't do it well, because human beings are the only creatures uh, that have to go to school to solve our challenges. I mean, the, the bees, I'm saying it all, all the time. Bees don't learn uh, by chemistry, but they produce their honey, they, you know, many other things. But we have to learn. So if we're not able to meet our challenges, do things for ourselves, then it means our education system is faulty. That's how I, I take it. And so from there- Our educational system is faulty. Yes. So we, if S, we've been doing S, SHS, free SHS. If there are challenges, we have to sit down and say, how do we resolve these challenges? A review may be necessary, uh, change certain things. Do you, do you think, from everything you've read, seen, do you think there are challenges? I think so. I mean, every sensible person will have to review your activities and not say that what I started seven years ago is still the best. Uh, because if we look at the feeding, uh, you know, is that, even one can talk about it. Can't there be a proper feeding center in a district where the food will be prepared and then maybe ship to the various schools in that, in that vicinity, you know, so that the, the food will be uniform, well examined, and uh, you know, catering officers and dietitians. You know. This is what I think that we need to look at all these things. I'm not saying that we should go that way, but there should be a review of how we are teaching them, how we are feeding them, and so on. It's, it's necessary. Oftentimes, when you bring up uh, the issue of corruption, um, the president will defend 
his, his people. And in the last State of the Nation address, he completely ignored anything bordering on corruption. What is the state of affairs from where you sit when it comes to corruption? Are we winning the war? No, we have not started the fight against corruption. Uh, is the We've biggest, not even no, started no, no, the no. fight against corruption. I think corruption is the biggest challenge that we face, not only in this country, but in Africa. It is the biggest thing that is worrying us. It's the, the, the denominator in everything that we do. And if we don't get... Because, see, even the system is already corrupted. When you need to bribe delegates to elect you as uh, MP or flag or whatever it is, that is the beginning of corruption. You know? So it, we have to be serious with the, with the fight against corruption and, and whatever that entails. We have not started it. We've not even started the fight. No, I don't think so. We have Shraj, we have the Office of the Special Prosecutor, we have all of these institutions. And you say we've not even started... That. No, I don't think so. The President would disagree with you. Because well, he feels he's done a lot. That is his opinion. I, mean, you know, I don't think the President can say, or has said, I didn't, I didn't hear it, I don't think the President can say that he has fought and won the battle against corruption. No, he, he will not say that. You don't think he will say that? No, 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 no. He, he knows that there's a fight to be fought, and battles to be won. Mm. Uh, you, I don't know whether you followed the work of the special prosecutor, though, uh, Kizia Jabin. Uh, what, what do you make of his work? I mean, I famously, Cecilia Dapa, I, among others. No, I don't want and, to comment, I don't want to comment uh, on what he's doing. Uh, mm. uh, because, no, whether he, you feel he's, he's living up to expectation or not. No, whatever I say, because he arrested me you know, once, and so... <laughs> Oh, you think, you think if you said something, you no, would I'm, suffer for that? No, I will not suffer for that. But what I'm saying is that whatever I say will be tainted with the episode that I had in his office. Uh, but then, you know, certain things are not being investigated. And that, and that one means, for example, why is he silent on the National Cathedral issue and all the stories that we are hearing? Are they all warrant investigations? Mm. Yeah. So maybe he should, he should be broadening his scope and looking into I think other... Broadening his scope, yeah. Mm -hmm. Speaking of which, though, what do you think about the National Cathedral? Now, now it is there, uh, we've spent millions, and now we are looking at so much more money if we're going to complete it. And some have said, you know what, if a future administration comes, change it into something else, an academic institution, an institution to teach governance, a hospital, what do you think? Well, basically, I'll start from the very beginning. You know, in the Bible, there was a king... King Solomon, who was said to be a man after God's own heart, he wanted to build a cathedral or a, a temple for God. But God said, no, it's a good idea, but you should not be the one to build it. So the originators of that, that idea, that they wanted to do, build a cathedral for uh, God, what did God tell them? That they should go ahead or they should not go ahead? So that is my first question. Mm. And the fact that we have people like Benson Otabio and Dark Ward Mills backing out of that project tells me that there was something wrong. So, I, and also where we are now, we spend, spend so much money and there's a big gap or a big hole there, it's also a problem. I mm. think that uh, maybe, I, I don't know, if I want to do something for God, I will sit down, pray, and meditate, and also hear well from God whether he really he wants me to do that. But not everything that comes to our head will, will be for. Uh, God's glory. Mm. Uh, of course, going back to David and Solomon and, and that instance there. And not everything we do will be for God's glory. Yeah. The president did say, though, that you know, this had been his promise uh, to God. I don't doubt that at all. You don't doubt it? No, no. Mm. Uh, but, but, but this would be a promise not fulfilled, right? Yeah, no. It's, again, David promised, but God said, don't, don't do this. Well, when he promised, what, did he, what was the feedback from God? Mm. His son. No, I mean, son came well, in, in our case. Oh, okay. I, are you alluding to the biblical story? Because there he was told no. that, listen, you, I picked you, this you were a shepherd that, boy and all no, of that. See, and because a president is a very important person. If he says, I'm going to do this, I'm going to do this for God. Mm. There's a reason why he wants to do that. But my question is that, what, did, what was the feedback from God? What did he hear from God? That, oh, please go ahead and do it. Or... Oh, okay. This is what I'm saying. Mm. So maybe, maybe... The president may have got it wrong. It's, it's possible. It's good to say, dream about something, but then uh, the one it is intended for will say, no, I'm sorry, you are not the one to do it for me. No, it's a good idea, but maybe leave it for a few years. I see. Maybe let it percolate for a while. Yeah.
Uh, since we're on that front, let me also sneak in this. Recently, Alan Sherbatin mm -hmm. of the um, Butterfly Movement, Movement for Change, has stoked a conversation. I'm, I'm sure you've heard him talk about the fact that he thinks, he feels, Ghana needs a Christian leader and that in the election 2024, a Christian must be voted for, a Christian must win. We've had quite a balance, Christian, Muslim, traditionalists, and all other religious groupings in Ghana. What do you make of such a call? Because members of the MPP feel his words target Dr. Baumia. Well, I'm, that is his opinion, and I'm not here to criticize it or approve it. No, that is Alan's opinion, and I will not comment on it. I see. Then let's come to Galamse. Still so many stories. Ashanti region, wherever you... In fact, was it some months ago, I, I, I was so stunned. I laughed within me, but it, it was shocking. Uh, district, I think it's district's officials of the Forestry Commission were basically saying, look, we are tired. You meet these people with excavators and everything. We do everything. Next thing you know, the calls come. And some people reach out. And it is impeding. We, we are basically helpless. The president put his presidency on the line for this fight. And here we are. Something that has even got you into trouble, so to speak. Mm -hmm. When you look now, what do you see, Galam say? It's very sad, you know, because not only the Forestry Commission, there are, there's a program going on in this country, restoration of land in the cocoa growing areas, being undertaken by the EPA and the Ministry of Lands and Natural Resources. And they will tell you, they go and reclaim the land, plant trees, and after some time, when you go there, they've created the trees and they are doing mining over there. You know, so, and uh, some people are doing mining in forest reserves with impunity. And the cause that you say uh, come to the Forestry Commission, where do the come, cause come from? Certainly not from ordinary people. Mm. And so that is where we have to look at the thing. Where are the cause coming from? Certainly from people with political power or social influence or and so on. So uh, these, those people are supposed to stop what they are doing so that this thing is going to cost us. In fact, it's already cost us a lot, of, but we don't know. Uh, we are going to suffer a lot in the future because of the pollution of the environment and the degrading degradation of the biodiversity and so on. In, in, I mean, in the Western region, recently, my friend um, Daryl Bosu, who is with Arusha Ghana, an environmentally conscious group, shared some footage from the Western region. And actually, a major road, you would see stretched to your left, as far as your eyes can see, to your right, road, onward to two. There are buildings there that are literally collapsing. Uh, any mudslide or something, and those buildings will go. And, and it's right here in Ghana. Did you ever experience that, though? I mean, you've spoken about some of this before, where while you were minister, uh, you got some of those calls? Yes. And I'm in court because of one of them. So I, I don't want to go there. It's a delicate matter. Yes. But you did get those calls. Yes. And I'll not listen to you. Mm. And, and when I, there, was, there were serious problems, I called the president himself and told him about the challenges that I was facing. I, you know, I want to be frank with you. I have a message that says, and there are so many of them, but I'm just looking at this. Why not make this man the next MPP flag bearer? He has knowledge in almost every aspect of the economy instead of da-da-da-da, who has not done. Okay, so let me leave it there. You served as minister. Yes. Sometimes, too, the saying is that good people don't want to get into leadership because they are afraid of the stain of politics. If that ever came up, where people felt you could lead this country, is it a mantle you would take on? No, look at my hair. I'm, I'm growing old, you know, and... Our president is 80. You see, we have to... Of course, uh, if, you know, we have to prepare and hand over this nation to young people because we cannot build their future. The future is for them. We have to encourage them, show them the way so that the young people of this nation will build their future. It's not bad for old people to get into politics. But we don't go there and surround yourself with old people. You know, we go there with the aim of bringing up young people so that they can 
build their own future. That is extremely important. And we need knowledgeable people, people who, look, I mean, people don't have money, they come to produce, then they become rich, acquire properties, and then, then, then they disrespect us. That is my, what I hate in this country, you know. You know, okay, we can take the money, but then respect Ghanaians or respect people. Mm. Uh, you feel they take the money and they disrespect us on top yeah. of it? Adding insult to injury. Yeah, exactly. Mm. But there are people in this country who really just want to do something for Ghana. Mm. And, um, and you are one of them. You've already done you know, so much I, for that, that is my worry, because when I was coming, money was not an issue at all. I wanted to do something. Uh, so I was judging more, many people with my mentality, I thought people would behave like I was behaving. That was not the case. But they would judge you. They don't care about helping people. Uh, they care about what they need. And so they would judge you according to their standard. And so they think that if this man is doing this, then there must be something in it for him. And, and that is worrying. And when I got to know that's the, how people think, I became very sad for, for this country. You know, but, because, but I know now there's, you know, many areas, Ghanaians, who really want to do something, but they will not get a chance to do it. They just want to help. On the back of everything you've seen, from Kolebu to becoming a minister, do you regret entering politics? Not at all. No, I don't regret at all. Because I can say, I went in there with a clear conscience, I was determined to work and introduce certain things. If the things that I initiated were done, were completed, Ghana will not be the way it is now. In any case, I've chronicled all my activities as minister in, in a book. Uh, I've, the manuscript is ready. Somebody is reading to, uh, to be published so that people will know what I did as minister. I, I like doing that. Mm. I don't regret. Uh, but you but, were frustrated. Uh, I don't get frustrated. I fight, you know. I, if you, you know, I fight until you say, okay, this man is too troublesome. Let's get, get, get rid of him. And then I go back and sit in my place and enjoy my private life. So they because got you out of Kolebu and you I went aside. Always... And they got you out of the ministry and you stepped aside. Again. And um, when I get out, I become better because there are many things I'm doing at any particular stage. So I'm not bored at all. And I'm not greedy. I mean, people are looking for money to build in Ghana and build in every nation in Europe and 10 houses in America. I'm not like that. I don't have any house apart outside Ghana. I stayed in Germany for 10 years. I, was, I didn't want to buy anything, any property there. So money is not an issue. Just we came here with nothing. We go with nothing. But whilst we are here, we have to do God's work. And God's work is to care for the last, the least, and the lost. You know, there's so much hurting in this country that I don't see how people can be happy and use money taken from Ghana to board and do all sorts of crazy things abroad when there's so much suffering in this country. It worries me. Looking at the way, the manner in which you exited the, the ministry, um, do you feel aggrieved in any way? No, I feel sad for Ghana. Because there are so many projects we started. If we had, even if they had comp uh, continued after me, I'm not... I would not have been, because I gave everything, proper briefing to the one who took over from me, got uh, an external draft, this size, uh, copied everything, and described everything, how to get on, but then everything was abandoned, and that's where we are. I want to tell you, me, I'm blessed. God has blessed me so much that wherever I live, there's a gap. And if you don't take care, you cannot uh, fill that gap, and you'll be in trouble. Anybody who cannot work for Home Martin gets into trouble. It means you are neglecting or ignoring people who are dedicated, who are patriotic, who are God-fearing, who want to do something for humanity. So if you don't want such a person, then you end up with the sort of things that we see now. Because if I'm there, I will make my voice be heard. We have a few minutes to go. Uh, that also reminds me of a machines tooling center that we were going to put up. I don't know whether that was one of your... your your pet projects mm -hmm. and uh, we've also heard some claims from here and there about starting this it, it's not been put together but what can you tell us about that before I, I pose my final question to you that one is part of the and that was supposed to be in Kwabinya, right yes uh, that uh, this was it wasn't done I left and then the place is as it was in 2021 or 2020 
Uh, what was uh, it supposed to do? Well, I'll report on that in my uh, next time we meet. Uh, I see. Uh, you don't want to talk about it, though? No. My final bit to you, before I take your final words. On a scale of 1 to 10, we're in the eighth year of the reign of Nanado Dankwe Kufuado. On a scale of 1 to 10, everything being equal. I mean, we're in April. <laughs> How much more is left to be done? How do you assess him? Well, I will not assess him because I was part of the system for four years. Uh, it was not as bad as we, are, we have now, uh, but now things are not going well. Uh, but I will, to be very wrong on my part, to give him a mark. Uh, mm. There are challenges uh, which we have to uh, fight and overcome. And so what I will say is that I'm not happy with the state of the nation, state of the economy, there's so much suffering, Education is uh, not doing well. Power system needs a lot of things need complete overhaul in this country. That's what I will say for now. How about the vice president, uh, the self-proclaimed um, driver's mate? Would you assess him? No, I don't want to assess him. No, but I'll, I'll do so as vice president. Uh, I can do it, but I'll not do it now. You'll not do it now. No. When will you do this? Soon. Soon. Yes. Okay. Hopefully, when that soon comes, yes. you will interact with me. Sure, thank you. <laughs> Any final words for us, Prof? Yeah, final words. Uh, I mean, so long as we are alive, we let's have hope. And hope that God will help us build a better nation, leave this country for our grandchildren. For, for my children, it's too late. Grandchildren and those that are kind of them in a, in a better shape. Let's not focus on money, but focus on what is true, what is lovely, what is helpful for the next generation. We need to save this country from ourselves. We need to save this country from ourselves. It's been really uh, good having you join us today for this conversation. And I am super proud of you for what you've done as far as the cardio center and other aspects of our lives are concerned. And also proud that you speak your mind and say it as it is. Yeah. I feel today you've been a bit more um, reserved, yeah? reserved, but no, I guess it, it, it's the mood of the morning. Yes. It's a wet morning. Mm. Well, here we are, and uh, we draw the curtains now on this conversation with a man who has a heart and has saved many hearts and lives. Uh, he's been the one, the brain behind the cardiothoracic center at the Kolibu Teaching Hospital. And of course, he's also served as minister for science, technology, uh, and um, environment. Was it environment? Environment, science, science technology, and technology, and innovation. And innovation. I always forget that last one. Environment, science, technology, and innovation. innovation. And he also has this book. You might want to grab a copy. Krabna from Pomboating, Deep Down My Heart, A History of Cardiothoracic Surgery in Ghana. A piece you would definitely want to uh, look at. Prof, thank you once more for joining us for this conversation. Thank you for having me on this, this morning. Do stay with us. Also on the show, the founder and leader of the Movement for Change, Alan uh, Kwejo Chamateng, has faced backlash from supporters of the New Patriotic Party after advocating that Ghanaians vote for a Christian leader. We're asking, is this backlash justified? Is Alan pitching Christians against other religions? And does his comment hinder the social cohesion the nation currently enjoys. That conversation up next, you want to stay for that.